This is Joel Selvin with a special edition of Selvin on the City. Actually, Tonight, in the windy city, Chicago, with Steve right, Miller, here to film this special feature of the DVD. We're going to join Steve in the back of a checker cab while we drive around the south side neighborhoods where Steve cut his teeth as a blues musician. Let's join Steve in the cab right now. Here we are in Chicago, uh, you know, and uh, it's great to see you, pal. It's always good to be here yeah. and good to see you. Why did you come to Chicago? Uh, you know, I really came here because I wanted to play blues and I knew that, uh, you know, Paul Butterfield was playing here and that, that was like, uh, wow, maybe I could make records. You know, maybe, maybe I really actually could pull this off, you know. And, you know, Muddy was here and Helen Wolf was here and James Cotton was here and uh, A.C. Reed and Little Walter and there was this very mature music scene going on full tilt and uh, there were nightclubs uh, to work in and uh, there was a, a really great music scene going on and when I say mature I mean as opposed to Frankie Avalon and Anna right. Punicello and you know had you been here TV rock yeah I had uh, come through and uh, seen uh, Butterfield play and at Big John's, and some friends took me over and said, hey, you know, go check this guy out, and he had just been written up in Time Magazine, and I walked in and went, oh, I can do that, hey, there's a, hey, I'll be right back with the band, <laughs> and uh, it was pretty cocky, you know, but uh, um, it really was, uh, it was like getting a master's degree and a doctor's degree in blues being here, so it was... Uh, you know, just something I had to do. And at that point in my life, it was great. Uh, Big John's was a happening club. It was on the near north side in Old Town, pretty kind of interesting place. It had been sort of a folk music kind of center, and it was turning into a, 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 a this blues scene was coming out of the south side. And, uh, you know, Muddy was just beginning to come from the south side over to the near north side to play and um, went in, the joint was packed, and it was Sammy Lay and uh, Jerome Arnold and Elvin Bishop and Paul Butterfield, and it was just the four of them, and it was just a great band, a fabulous band. Butterfield was great. And it was before Bloomfield joined the band and sort of turned it into something else, you know, it really changed when, when Mike joined. But it was pure classic Chicago blues band, and uh, wonderful music, just great music, and uh, you know it was a really exciting thing to actually see. And um, the next time I came back, you know Muddy had just come in, and you know it was the first time I saw Muddy Waters live in a room that held you know 120 people or something like that. At Big John's. And, yeah, and. Uh, you know, it was just fabulous. It was incredible music. Well, I met Muddy at Big John's. Classic, uh, classic deal. You know, he came in to play. And uh, I was there the first time Muddy played at Big John's. And it was a big deal. These guys were, like, trying out this white world. What is this? Another gig, you know? And they came in, and Muddy was so dignified and so good-looking and dressed so beautifully. And he, he was amazing. He sort of looked like an Indian chief or something. He had a big pompadour, very beautiful face, and was just very, very, very together, pulled together. And um, I watched him play, you know, two or three nights, and he came in for a week. And... Um, after he'd been there about three or four nights, uh, I really wanted to jam with him. And, uh, you know, they played till four o'clock in the morning, and there were always jam sessions, you know, two o'clock in the morning, stuff like that. Things would happen. And I got up on, on the stage and, you know, got to play with Muddy the first time when he was there. And uh, it was a, you know, a magical moment because of uh, the fact that his musicians and his band, they were just so good and so real and 
I learned so much about volume control and, and you know technical things from watching these guys play, and and um, also just about feeling, you know, and what what uh, what it could really sound like, and and that's why I said earlier, you know, it's like a the, a doctor's degree in bluesology to actually be around. I probably heard Muddy and his band play a hundred times, and uh, same way with Woof. Understand that Butterfield sort of started out as like a, a, a novelty at the black clubs, like "Ooh, look at that white kid." Yeah, but you know, um, the the thing about the clubs that was really beautiful was um, if you could play the music, that's what they were really interested in was having a good time. It wasn't whether you were white or black, and I'm sure there was kind of a novelty at first, and then that was quickly forgotten and he, he was just a you know a great great harmonica player and and he had a great band tickets his band was kind of uh, you know the like the little walter band it was at that, that quality uh before bloomfield joined it and it changed it was it was like this really wonderful chicago classic chicago blues band didn't there get, weren't a lot of those around like that good, you know. I mean, they were. He was the best harp player, and he was running it as a harp player's band. You know, it wasn't like James Scott was a harmonica player in the Muddy Waters band. It was about Muddy Waters. This was a harmonica-driven band, and that was a very cool thing. You know, a, um, a different kind of band. You know, and Little Walter would be the guy who wrote the book on that, and actually. It, for my money, wrote the book on Chicago blues. You know, he's the guy who kind of put the band together behind Muddy that made Muddy stuff sound like it does. And and when you listen to the little Walter records, that's the mother load. <laughs> Never really heard a, a lot about uh, little Walter, except that he was tough and, and uh, you know, a few tales about, you know, incidents on bandstands and, you know, things like that, but um, for me, all I have to do is listen to a little Walter record, and that's enough. What was Chicago like at the time? It was it was a, a, a tough, uh, Mayor Daly kind of town, uh, headed to the 1968, uh, you know, uh, political rallies and beatings and stuff like that. Uh, Black Muslims were patrolling up and down the streets. Malcolm X was around. Uh, it was um, tough. Uh, the mob was, you know, like every now and then, you know, there'd be a little dry cleaners and, you know, the front window would be blown up. And there was a lot of shaking down going on, a lot of punks. Uh, police were, you know, pretty corrupt. You had to, you had to know all the angles. And uh, it, was, it, it was a tough tough spot but it was full of art full of creative people uh neighborhoods you know that hadn't been discovered and gentrified and I you know I had a friend who lived in a funky old house that had a pipe organ and you could find places like that for real low rent you know <laughs> and and uh, of course brutal winters too you know but uh, a lot of great music the main thing for for us was th the fact that really Howling Wolf and Muddy Waters two giants were in town and we were all competing for the same nightclub gigs. The first time I saw Holly Wolf, I had to go see him. I'd heard his records of course and was just in love with him and and I used to smoke camel cigarettes and I'd wake up in the morning and do my Holly Wolf, you know, I, I am. <laughs> and, and uh, he was playing at his club uh, where one of the big clubs on the west side called Sylvia was underneath the L tracks, kind of a rough neighborhood. And I had a friend with me named Hart McNee, who was a, a really good tenor player and a flute player, weighed about 117 pounds. And Hart and I decided, okay, we're going over to Silvio's and we're going to go see Helen Wolf. So we work our way over and the neighborhood's just getting deeper and rougher and tougher and tougher. And then there's this club underneath the L tracks, you know, with down in this corner with a bunch of thugs hanging outside, you know, and we get home in 
So we go in. It's this long, narrow room, and the bar's on one side of the room, and there's this little wedding cake bandstand, and there's this band. They're all in turquoise tuxedos with black lapels. Hubert Salmon standing on the, you know, I recognized him immediately. And uh, the band is playing, and you can hear Wolf singing, but there's no Wolf. And so I said you know, to the bartender, I said, where's Howlin' Wolf? He says, oh, he's in the other room. Just right through there. So I, I, the door's kind of partially closed. We opened the door and walked in, and we were in what would be like a rotary club or luncheon room or a high school lunch cafeteria. All the lights are on. There's 100 tables, and there's this whole room full of country people. You could just look at them, and they were just country people. And they're all sitting at the table, and they've all got drinks. And Howling Wolf is sitting on a chair. He's got big, big old black shoes and white socks and blue slacks and a white shirt on. He's sitting on a chair, singing and doing his stuff. And the band is around the corner in another room <laughs> playing. And it's all just Howling Wolf. His amplifier, his mic, and you can hear the band pretty good. And we walked in right in front of Howling Wolf. We didn't know what was going on, so we're standing there in front of like 200 people sitting there watching, you know, you know and it was one of those kind of awkward moments, you know, and so we kind of, <laughs> oh, and so Hart and I just sort of slid in the wall and, and we went to the back and sat down. And when Howling Wolf finished his tune, he said, I want y'all to say hello to my little white friends back there. You know, and, and um, that's the kind of guy he was. And, you know, we were scared to death, really, because it was a bad, tough place. And um, went up to see him, and he was just nice as he could be. And we started a friendship, but it really lasted a long time. He's a wonderful, sweet guy. And uh, when he came out to California, you know, I picked him up and met him and drove him around and took him around and, you know, set up his gear for him and just helped him do everything when he came out because he was just such a great guy. And, what an icon, you know, the wolf. He was huge, and he was cat-like, and he was quick, and he was very sensitive, and he was really deep, and he intimidated people because of his size. He had the biggest hands. I mean, his hands really, literally were the size of a baseball glove. He was this great big guy, very handsome, big man, and... Um, uh, it, 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 his personality when he sang was just amazing. I mean, it was like he was possessed or something. And uh, Delmark was uh, a very small label, and Bob um, Kester Kester he had was, a record store, right? Had a record store, great record store. Was a great fan and scholar of blues and a good source, you know, of the resource for scholarly work. Um, he made what I consider to be one of the very best records that ever came out of Chicago, which is Voodoo Man Blues. And um, that is just the most reasonable record there that was ever been made. I mean, just he captured Junior and Buddy at their finest, very, very finest. And I don't think they ever captured anything like that since, you know. You know, I grew up in Texas, and I was, you know, Les Ball taught me guitar, and T-Bone Walker taught me how to play lead guitar, and I was around a lot of good blues players, Lightning Hopkins, people like that. Went to the University of Wisconsin. Uh, didn't quite finish school. I was about six credits short of graduating, and my parents came up. And we had the, that meeting that all students have with their parents. And, you know, it was like, Steve, what are you going to do? You know, and I said, well, uh, you know, I thought about it a lot. And I'd really like to go to Chicago and play blues. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, my father gave me that, you know, that look like you know, all fathers would, you know. And, you know, if he did a two-by-four, he would have hit me in the head with it. But my mother 
who came from a musical family whose brothers were all musicians. One of them played in the Paul Whiteman Orchestra, and they were, you know, hot jazz violin players and stuff. Looked at me, and she said, Stevie, that is a great idea. <laughs> she said, I think you ought to leave tomorrow morning. You know, here's a hundred bucks. <laughs> and uh, I just took off for Chicago the next day. You know? Did you the next day? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what was your first move here? Well, my first move was um, I, I came into town. I um, had a friend who had a, a little apartment uh, off of the main street and uh, met, a, you know, had a name or two, you know check this guy out, meet that guy, and uh, started looking around and, and was introduced to Barry Goldberg. And Barry was a, a great organ player and blues player. And um, met Barry. We played together and just instantly went, oh yeah, this is going to work great. And then uh, we uh, found Roy and Maurice and, and, and put a band together. Uh, I'd say it probably took me about two, three weeks of getting to town to, to get a band together. And then then we had we had to start figuring out where we were going to work and how we were going to work it. And uh, Barry and I, you know, started uh, the World War III Blues Band. And uh, we started uh, working next door to Big John's in a little mafia nightclub that had a little problem with uh, other gang members and they cut the electricity and there was some beatings were administered and, <laughs> and that was my you know like my break into like holy cow man this is one tough town so I was you know scuffling around and then we went over to the south side of the club Melody and stole Corky Siegel's gig immediately <laughs> And, uh, uh, you know, ran into Corky, and Corky and I became friends, and, and he, he turned me on to, you know, that gig over there. We went over and started playing there, and, and that was really, like, uh, the real deal. You know, that wasn't some kind of near north side kind of college kid uh, place. That was just a funky joint, you know, with signs on the wall, like, if you can't talk nice, don't talk at all kind of signs and things like that, and just a neighborhood tavern, you know, and, and we started working anywhere we could. And then uh, we came to uh, the attention of the guys at Big John's and, uh, you know, Butterfield took off and went east and we went, we moved in and took his slot at Big John's. And, and then um, we got a, a recording contract, a bunch of uh, record companies. There was a record convention in town and they, everybody was brought over to hear us play. and. It was Barry's manager. He had he had all the stuff together, and I was just learning the ropes. And uh, we then um, went to a local studio here, recorded our album in a day, a day and a half or something to do the album. When we walked in, they had just finished recording the Sunday Picnic Polka, and the engineers hated us, you know. And we had little hard plastic you know one-sided earpiece things and they they just thought an amplifier turned on volume three was just you know really bad and um, I think we were on epic records and um, you know they um, you know guy that was the vice president came in and you know I want you to do a whole lot of shaking going on I want you to do this and they start telling us everything to do Barry was writing the songs I was the guitar player and the singer and uh, we did a tune called The Mother Song that Barry had written. And the next thing I know, we're going to New York and we're on Hullabaloo with the Supremes and the Four Tops. And, um, you know, it, I mean, I'm kind of going, wow, uh, the showbiz, hey, you know. I think we, we did a good job on Hullabaloo. We played our blues, and we were, I mean, you, that, the tapes of that are pretty good. And uh, then we went to work at uh, the phone booth in, in New York, which was the club where the Rascals broke out of. And so the Rascals had just moved out of that, and we moved in, and we played there for about a month. And then when we got back to Chicago, it was like the whole scene in Chicago was gone. 
everybody had left Chicago and they were all out around the world playing Chicago blues. They were in London, they were in San Francisco, and the scene just dried up like that. And um, it was time to go, time to leave Chicago. How did you hook up with Buddy Guy? How did you end up in his band? Well, um, the scene, you know, we got back from the New York deal in 65, the hullabaloo stuff, and, and the scene was really changing. And Buddy Jr. had made his record deal and kind of left Buddy. Kind of like, see ya. <laughs> And, uh, you know, it, it was always, you know, like to be the leader of the blues band, the guy who ran the band was the most powerful position. And there was always a lot of, you know, is Hubert playing with Muddy or is he playing with Howling Wolf? You know, and a lot of talk about, you know, who's in whose band and stuff like that. And Buddy was around and, uh, you know, ran into him at uh, one of the clubs and, he was putting a new band together and asked me to join his band. I said, yeah, I'd love to. And, um, you know, it, it, I played for about a month. And, you know, I literally, I couldn't, I couldn't drink like that and do that. <laughs> you know, it was, that was the beginning of something that was going to really do me in. I was uh, uh, playing rhythm guitar in, in Buddy Guy's band. And Buddy's rule was, you had to have one shot of bourbon before each set. And we played from nine at night till four o'clock in the morning. I was about twenty-two years old, you know. I was getting like, Buddy, I can't do this. <laughs> it's like club life's killing me. I was twenty-two, you know. <laughs> and, and so I, I was very, you know, glad to get out of the nightclub business and into the concert. Uh, world of the Fillmore Auditorium, the Family Dog, and and uh, when I first went to California, uh, the first night I got to San Francisco it was a Sunday night. I went right to the Fillmore Auditorium. Butterfield was playing there. The Jefferson Airplane had just said goodbye to their lead singer and Grace, and in, introduced Grace Slick as their new lead singer that night. And I you know, weaseled my way right up on the stage with Butter and did three tunes and announced who I was and that I was moving to San Francisco and bringing my band. <laughs> Got a big round of applause. <laughs> Good stuff. Thanks to Butter. It's like these neighborhoods, you know, you think it's always going to be there and people are always going to play like that. When you come back to Chicago now and you gather up the blues guys and say, hey, we're going to do some, some Howlin' Wolf tunes, they don't know how the Howlin' Wolf tunes go. you got to pull up the records and the charts and say, no, no, guys, this. You know, it's turned into disco nightclub music or something. And, uh, you know, I was just fortunate to be there at that, that moment. And later, you know, when I was about 40 years old or something, I kind of went, wow, I'm one of a handful of people in the world who really understands what this is about. It's there.